And welcome to today's session of the Deployment Book Club. Today is our final session, so I'm so excited to wrap up this month to talk about all the great elements of homecoming and reintegration and to really celebrate reaching the end of our ultimate deployment guide. All month long, we have been going through the various topics of deployment, and I've been talking to you about checklists and preparing and ways to build your friend network and use resources and strengthen yourself during deployment. And finally, today we reach the end of it all where we get to discuss homecoming and reintegration. Now, I will also let you know that I'm wearing my Red Friday shirt. Today is Friday and red, of course, stands for Remember Everyone Deployed. Thank you. And on Fridays, we wear red to celebrate and to recognize all those who are deployed. Even though my husband currently is not, I think it's a great way to show support and solidarity for other families who, of course, there's always someone deployed from the U.S. somewhere around the world. So hope that you enjoy it and you can get your own from The Waiting Warrior. She is a podcaster who supports military families and first responders, and she is the proud designer of this shirt. So I hope you'll check it out. Um, before we go into today's homecoming and reintegration topics, I will tell you what this video is not about. It is not about making a sign. It is not about choosing a homecoming outfit. And it is not about how to decorate your house for homecoming. And I think that unfortunately, for better or for worse, in the military community, we have started to associate the word deployment homecoming with all of those beautiful homecoming videos, the surprise videos, the TikToks, the decorations, the posters, people in the airport holding these cool designs, the custom outfits that are red, white, and blue matching with the kids and the parents. And those things are beautiful. I am not knocking people who want to celebrate homecoming that way. I myself have celebrated homecoming in some of those ways. We've done the posters. We've done the cute outfits. Uh, I had a banner on the house that welcomed him home uh, from several different deployments. But the reality is that when we talk about homecoming in those terms, we are only talking about homecoming day. And homecoming day is usually pretty easy. It's fun. Of course, it's a mixture of emotions. There's all of the waiting, all of the stress, all of the preparation, and you want everything to be just right. You want the house to be clean and you want yourself to look great, but that's just one day. And unfortunately, deployment doesn't end on homecoming day. If you'll remember in our very first session, we looked at this page at the cycle of deployment and the last cycle here, you'll see at the bottom, it says reintegration. Now, reintegration does not happen all at once. It is not just a one day event. Reintegration is the adjustment for the service member to return home, for the family to get used to having the service member back in the house again. Maybe you've changed houses and you're in a new place. There's gonna be new routines. Maybe you've added a baby to the family. The service member has to adjust to that. There's new jobs, there's big changes in life. And taking a service member out of the deployment environment and bringing them back home to the family environment is an adjustment period. For some people, this goes very smoothly. So I don't want to scare you and tell you that every single family is going to struggle with reintegration. Many people don't, and that's great but some people do. And so because some people struggle with that reintegration period, that's what we're going to be talking about today. There are a million places on Pinterest where you can get ideas for those homecoming signs and outfits and you know what to wear, what to hold, and how to decorate your house. But that's not what we're focusing on when I talk about homecoming and reintegration. I want to discuss the way that your family is adjusting to the end of deployment and getting used to your new stage of life, which we're all now familiar with the term new normal. And I know that's been used throughout the pandemic, but you know what? That term was used by military families coming home from deployment long before there was a pandemic. When deployment ends, you don't just go back to the way that things were. 
you can never really go back in time, not in your relationship, not in your job, and not in your cycle of deployment. So things will never quite be exactly the way that they were before the service member left, but that's okay. It, reintegration is about establishing that new normal, those new norms and routines for your family and figuring out how you and the service member can reconnect and enjoy your lives together. So that's why this page in the Ultimate Deployment Guide that talks about homecoming doesn't talk about the decorations and what to wear. It talks about expectations versus reality. And the reason it's written that way is because after many deployments and interviewing military families from across the country, I found that this was the biggest challenge that militaries face, or military families face during that reintegration period. The problem is that both parties, this can happen to the service member or to the spouse, both parties spend months building up expectations. From the spouse's side, maybe you are looking forward to a post-deployment vacation. Maybe you can't wait to spend some time alone with your service member. Don't we all look forward to that? Maybe you have been looking forward to starting up a job or a career or finally getting your degree once your service member comes home. Maybe you were a solo parent during the deployment and you cannot wait to share those parenting responsibilities with your spouse, with your partner, and finally get a break. Those are all completely normal expectations. But the trouble comes if the service member is not sharing those expectations. They might seem completely normal and reasonable to you as the spouse or as the significant other, but if your service member is not aware of your expectations, then that opens up room for disappointment and frustration. And this can happen on the flip side. This can happen when the service member has expectations about what life is going to be like after deployment. And sometimes if they have been single before for other deployments, they might be used to returning home to all of that deployment money sitting in the bank waiting for them. There's a nice deployment nest egg when single service members deploy and they have zero bills and zero responsibilities and all they do is save money during their deployment. But that expectation bubble will burst if they have a family back home and they have a mortgage or a car payment and that money has been used from the bank account and they just didn't connect those dots and realize that that's what was going to happen. The same can happen with post-deployment vacations. Maybe one person is really looking forward to a certain type of getaway. You want to go to the beach or take a cruise. But I learned the hard way that if my service member spent seven months in Iraq or Afghanistan surrounded by sand, he really didn't want to go to the beach. And then his sixth deployment was on a ship. It's called a MU, a Marine Expeditionary Unit. They go on a Navy ship for six to seven months. And when he came back from that, he really didn't want to go on a cruise. So it was one thing for me to build up these expectations of what our post-deployment vacation would look like. But if I didn't discuss those options with him and I just built these fairy tale imagination castles in the air, then I was setting myself up for disappointment. So after I saw this time and time again with so many military spouses being frustrated during this post-deployment reintegration period, I realized that the frustration was coming from unmet expectations or expectations that didn't match reality. So again, this can happen to both the service member and the spouse, but the questions that we need to ask ourselves and discuss with the service member are things like, what are the things I am most looking forward to after deployment? Are you looking forward to more downtime? Are you looking forward to being able to spend more time with friends? Are you looking forward to sharing those parenting responsibilities? Again, those are completely normal, reasonable things to expect, but you have to tell your spouse. Other expectations. How would I like to spend the vacation or the leave time? That's where you need to be on the same page about, does one person want to spend two weeks visiting family? And maybe the other person does not want to do that. Um, are you trying to get away together without kids? Or are you expecting that you're going to do a family event like go to Disney World? Those are completely different types of vacations and you need to discuss them to get together. 
Um, and other question is, what changes do I hope for in our relationship? Now, this is a very loaded one, and it takes a lot of personal reflection. But the reality is that people change during deployment. And sometimes it's tiny changes. Maybe you've adapted some of your routines at home. Maybe you've changed your diet so that you're eating healthier or you've cut out certain foods. Maybe you've started up a new hobby or a new routine and you're hoping that your service member will be part of that. Those are all small, healthy, normal changes. But when we're separated by great distances, sometimes we don't realize that those changes are happening in our partner. And so it's very common for couples to come back together after deployment and those little changes surprise them, confuse them, and frustrate them. Maybe one person has started a new hobby and expects to be able to go to a meeting or a club or a group every week, and the other person is expecting to have every single night at home, just the two of them, peace and quiet and relaxation. Well, that's a difference of opinion and a difference of expectation. There's nothing wrong with having friends and pursuing that hobby and going to that group. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But your service member needs to be aware that that's an important priority to you. And the same can happen for the service member. They get into different routines and they develop different interests when they're deployed. And sometimes they form very close friendships with those with whom they were deployed. And so it's common when they come back from deployment that the first thing they all want to do is get together with these people that they just spent months with and they want to have a barbecue or they want to have a game night or they want to hang out in the backyard. And sometimes to the spouses and the significant others, that's really frustrating and confusing. You know, why would you choose to spend time with these other dudes that you just were with for seven months straight instead of spending time with me? And that's not something that we should take personally. It's just the normal result of forming close friendships during deployment and wanting to continue those friendships in your normal post-deployment life. So again, none of these things have to be deal breakers. None of these things have to result in fights between yourself and your service member, but they are things that you should discuss because they're going to come up and they're going to cause those little moments of confusion and frustration between the two of you. And so you want to address them sooner, hopefully, rather than later. And I even had one spouse that gave a really good piece of advice that I'm going to share with you. Her idea was to keep a reintegration journal and she called it a journal of expectations versus reality. So in her journal, she would write down all of her hopes, all of her dreams, everything that she was looking forward to. But on the next page, she would have to kind of check herself and she would think about the realities of military life and think about the realities of her service member's personality. And she would write down those facts. So for example, you have to ask questions. This is in the reality section of the page. How much time will they have to spend at work initially? This can be a huge shock. I know when we get our service members back, we have been waiting for months and months, sometimes even a year to see them. And all you wanna do is spend every single second with them. But at least in the Marine Corps, and I think for many other branches, it's common that they have to go back into work the day after they come home from deployment. Either they have to turn in gear or clean weapons or do paperwork or do a debriefing. There's work events that they're expected to attend and it might be a short day, it might just be a few hours, but the reality is that they are gonna get up, put on their uniform and go back to work after you have been waiting months and months to spend time with them. And so sometimes family wants to come and be there for homecoming and celebrate with the, the family for homecoming. And I always encourage people to ask those questions. Will the service member have to go into work immediately afterwards? Because sometimes they aren't allowed to take that post-deployment leave vacation until a week or so after they returned from the deployment. So if the mom and the dad or the in-laws or the grandparents and all these people want to come into town to see the service member on homecoming day, they might be really disappointed to learn that for the days after homecoming, that service member is going back into work and they won't really get a break for a week or two down the road. 
So discuss that with your service member. Make sure that you know what their work responsibilities will be immediately after homecoming, because that can help you to plan physically and emotionally what that homecoming week is going to look like for you. Do you need to take time off of work? Are you gonna go into work and maybe wait until they get their leave block so that you can take vacation together? Do you need to arrange any childcare? Or are you gonna stay a night at a hotel somewhere close to the airport? There's lots of options, there's lots of ways to celebrate homecoming, but you need to keep that reality in check. Another good question is, how much money have we saved for a vacation? So my friend that kept the journal on one page, she might write all these beautiful ideas for vacation plans and getaways and wouldn't it be wonderful to spend a weekend here and maybe we can go to this amusement park and we can invite our the grandparents to come with us and do a week here, there, and the other place. But the reality on the next page, she would write down, you know, we've only saved a few hundred dollars each month. So we have a total of $2,000 for vacations that will get our family to one place for one week. We can't all go on a cruise. We can't all go to Disney World. We can't take the grandparents on this cross country tour, but maybe we can do this one particular vacation and event. So it's really important to have that budget discussion because you don't have to spend your post deployment money on a vacation. Some people save it for other reasons. Maybe you're paying off debt for your house or for your car or your student loans. Uh, maybe you have a big future purchase, like you're moving to a new duty station and thinking about buying a home there. There's a lot of things you can spend your money on besides vacation. So just because the service member returns with money in the bank account does not mean that it should automatically be allocated for the family trip. And that's a really important reality check that you need to have with your service member. You also need to assess how will our budget change now? If you remember, I think it was week one, we looked at the budget schedule that's in the deployment guide. And I talked to you about the ways that a household budget can change during deployment. Sometimes the income goes up and sometimes it goes down. And that depends on whether the service member had a civilian job for National Guard and Reserve families. They often find that their deployment pay goes down compared to the civilian pay. Um, it can depend on whether your service member is in a combat environment or receiving hazardous duty pay. In that case, their overall payment typically goes up, but once deployment ends, they'll go back to their standard um, regular paychecks. And it also depends on the spouse's income. Maybe you picked up extra hours and worked more during deployment because you were staying with family and you had childcare taken care of or any number of reasons. So in that case, you saw an increase of your income during deployment, but once deployment ends and that situation changes, is your pay going to go back down? Will the household budget be impacted? On the other hand, maybe you found that you were paying out of pocket for things during deployment to help with childcare, to get the house cleaned. Maybe you had to cut back on your hours at work in order to handle all of the responsibilities at home. And in that case, you were making much less during deployment and you may be able to increase your responsibilities and make more money after deployment. So the household budget can certainly change, but again, you and your service member need to discuss those changes and be on the same page. Because maybe during deployment, you were spending that money on childcare or getting the house cleaned. Maybe you've really enjoyed having that extra benefit and you would like to keep using it after deployment. But if your service member is under the impression that that was just a one-time deployment thing that's not part of the normal household budget, well, you're going to run into some problems because the money's not going to match up the way that you both thought it would. So definitely you need to talk about budget changes that are incurring after deployment. Find out when that deployment pay will end, what the service member's next paycheck is going to look like, and how that impacts your family overall. And it's totally acceptable to go back to that budget page and rework it for a non-deployment budget. Those numbers can work out either way. There's nothing in there that says it's specific to deployment. So you can use those budget pages, just write in pencil the first time, and then erase it and go back and adjust your budget after deployment. And then finally, this is a big one. What ways do I need to be patient or give them space? So a really strange thing happens during reintegration. 
two people who love each other and have spent months and months apart from each other, you'd think that they are both so excited to just come back together and spend every moment together and do everything together for the next few weeks. But the reality is that each of those individuals has gotten used to functioning on their own. They have got used to having their own space, making their own choices, having their own schedule and routines, and sometimes throwing two individuals back together and expecting them to share every moment together does not go smoothly. People have their own preferences of when they want to wake up and how they want to spend the day and what they want to eat. So sometimes, couples find that they actually need to give each other a little bit more space immediately following deployment. And that can be a real shock and a real frustrating thing to happen in your relationship. When you've spent months counting down the days, waiting to be back together, and then suddenly your service member is acting like they need some space and alone time and they wanna go play video games, excuse me, but that's the reality of life. Your service member is not going to just drop all of their interests, drop everything that they've done during deployment and immediately switch into husband mode or parent mode or I'm the good dad who's hands on and does things around the house mode. Instead, it's a gradual adjustment. So a lot of times I recommend for people that have young children, especially if the children have changed a lot during deployment, which includes babies, toddlers, preschoolers, whether or not you realize that they have gone through so many developmental stages during deployment, that probably the family routines have changed, the household rules have changed. And even if you have been discussing that with your service member, even if you've been doing video calls, they might not realize some of those changes. So I know that when my husband came home from some of our deployments, he forgot how to change a diaper or how to spoon feed the baby food. And this was not our first child. So he'd had experience doing those things before, but for him, it had been about two years since he had to do those activities. And for me, I had been doing them every day, multiple times a day for several months. So I couldn't expect him to just jump in and remember it right away. I had to give him some time to watch me to see what the routines were, to see how I interacted with that particular baby, because every baby's gonna be a little bit different. And after he had a few days to kind of absorb all that information, then he could start being more hands-on, participating, getting involved, and doing things himself. But a lot of times people get frustrated because as soon as the service member walks in the door, they just wanna be like, here, take the kids, take the baby, I'm done. I've done it everything for every day. I can't do it anymore enjoy your kids and it doesn't work that way so usually the service member needs some time and some space that you can't expect them to just take a task right away but instead let them watch let them ask questions let them figure out how things are working for you in the home and discourage them from trying to make changes right away some people complain that their service member walks in and just makes these knee-jerk decisions of, okay, we're gonna fix this problem with the kids. We're gonna do things this way now. Well, that rule's not working out. We definitely need to change that. I'm changing that rule right away. And when a parent reacts in such a, a strong knee-jerk manner, that's usually really confusing and frustrating for the whole family, the other parent and the children. So, try to encourage your service member not to make any immediate changes for a couple of days. Ask them to just observe and relax and be part of the home environment. But then after those few days have gone by, it's time to sit down and talk about some parenting things, talk about what they've observed, and then they can suggest changes and you can discuss those together and work on them together as parents. If you've ever watched the show, The Nanny, with the uh, British nanny that, comes to these households with horribly misbehaving children, sorry, misbehaving children. And the point of the show is that she has to help these families to get the kids under control and to make some positive changes. Well, the first thing that she does is she doesn't walk into the house establishing new rules and doing things differently. She usually spends a whole day observing the family in their natural habitat, 
She lets the parents make mistakes. She lets the people yell at the kids. She lets the kids act out and make bad choices. And all the time she's absorbing this and taking notes and trying to figure out what will help this family? What changes do we need to make? So the next day she comes back and starts making those changes. I think about that a lot during the reintegration period because things don't get fixed overnight. It definitely takes time. But the more that one parent or the other can step back and observe and not comment, not criticize, if your husband has not been changing diapers for months and suddenly wants to get involved and change the baby's diaper, the last thing you want to do is stand there making fun of them or telling them that they're doing it wrong. Because hey, they're changing a diaper. It's the first one you haven't had to change for a long time. So give them some space. Let them make their mistakes. Try not to criticize or tell them that they're doing things wrong. And then after a few days have gone by, that's when you need to meet together and discuss parenting and get on the same page again. Now, of course, the more that you can have these conversations before they return, the more that you can share through letters or emails or through video calls, the easier those conversations are going to be because they've seen the kids in action and they have understand the challenges that you're dealing with. But if you've had limited communication and you think that they might be a little bit surprised or caught off guard by the kids' behavior, then it's definitely time to give each other some space and be patient in that the period of change. Um, the other thing, the other reason that it says, what ways do I need to be patient and give the person space is because we each get used to having our own independent schedules and routines. And so sometimes when a service member returns and one or other of the people wants to go out of the house and meet up with friends or go eat dinner or do anything, the other person is asking, well, where are you going? When are you going to be back? Who are you with? And that type of questioning behavior can become really frustrating and grating to someone who has been independent and been on their own for so long. So if your service member is not quite used to making decisions based on your schedule or the family's schedule or the kids' routines, then try to give them a little bit of space to make those choices, to go and do what they need to do and run out to the store and buy something on their own and come back without it being a whole family event. But again, make sure that you discuss it and decide, hey, how do we each feel about spending one evening apart doing our own separate activities? How would you feel if I went to the gym for an hour each morning? Would that imp impact you? Would you enjoy that? Would you want to come with me? There's plenty of ways to solve these issues that come after deployment, but they can't get resolved if they aren't discussed. So that's the essential information from this reintegration page in the Ultimate Deployment Guide. We really want you to focus on being true to yourself. Be honest about your own expectations because we all have them, whether they are expressed or not, whether they're conscious or subconscious. Be honest about the expectations you have. And then just as important is to be honest about reality. What are the military demands on your service member and your family? What are the realities of your own personalities? Do not model your reintegration and homecoming experience on your neighbor or your friend because every couple is going to do things differently. But the more that you can express to your service member what your expectations are and truly listen to their expectations, the easier it is to get on the same page and to restart and to reintegrate after deployment. Now, I mentioned in the beginning, some people go through the reintegration process very easily and smoothly. Usually within about a week or so, most couples find that they've gotten, the, you know, they've worked through those bumps, things are mostly back to normal, they're feeling pretty confident about their relationship. And that's great. But not all couples have that success rate. Some people say that it can take one to two months after homecoming 
to actually feel like you're on a normal routine and to feel like reintegration has completed. So don't have expectations about everything being worked out in the first few days after homecoming. Give yourself grace, give yourself time, and make sure that you have those conversations with your service members so that you can take the time you need to work things out smoothly and not expect that everything is gonna go back to normal within the first week. So that is a very quick summary on what to expect from homecoming reintegration. Of course, there is a lot more that we could say about this topic. And in fact, there is a lot more that we've said about this topic in the Deployment Masterclass. I spent almost an hour interviewing three different military spouses with, from different homecoming experiences to find what were the challenges that they faced, what were some of the odd quirks that they noticed about their service member after deployment, how did they work out some of those differences with or without kids. Um, we discussed a ton of different things and it was an incredible interview. People were very honest and it was really wonderful to see that you know some of that fear and doubt and insecurity that we have in the days after homecoming, that's completely normal. Okay, no one eases into reintegration without any effort at all. So hearing from other spouses and learning that it's not just about one person's experience, it's not just about what I've been through, but that many people are saying the same things and facing the same challenges, that can give you a lot of confidence to know that not only what you're going through is completely normal and common, but also it's something that other people have worked through. And if other people have worked through it and had success, then probably you can too. It just might take some time and some effort. So the full reintegration video is in the Deployment Masterclass. I will drop a link to the Deployment Masterclass, but it is a subscription program that once you've registered, you have immediate access to this whole video training library with experienced military spouses discussing the most common deployment challenges. And you can watch those videos at any time. You can watch them all before de deployment, right in the middle of it when you're going through things, or at the end as you get closer to homecoming. It's great to watch that homecoming video and get a refresher on what to expect and how to act. So I hope that you will find that helpful. I hope that you will consider signing up for the Deployment Masterclass. There's so much more information in there that I can't portray in here. But the exciting thing is that that brings us to the end of our book club for the Ultimate Deployment Guide. We have now covered all 28 pages of this guide from beginning to end. We have gone through the checklist. We have discussed why things are important. We have made plans. We have made budgets. And we have collected the phone numbers that we need to succeed during deployment. So I really want to hear from you. I want to see some of the completed pages in your guide. I would love to see how you've added things to your bucket list, what you think is important to finish in your guide, and we want to see all those pictures of your completed pages. So feel free to add them. This group will stay live for the coming months, so if you missed some of the videos or you weren't able to watch them in full, they will continue to be posted on the page. You can check those out anytime. And um, I think that wraps up our book club. So I want to thank you again for participating. If you have any other questions, of course, feel free to leave them in the comments or leave them in the group here. I will be continuing to monitor it and answering them promptly. So I have really loved sharing this guide and sharing some of my deployment experiences with you. I hope that you will continue to share your experiences with the group so that we can all learn from each other. And I wish you the best of luck with your deployment journey. I know that there will be t difficult times and there will be tough days ahead, but I also want you to know that you are not going through this alone. We are here to support you and encourage you through this journey, and we want you to make the most of your deployment experience. So please feel free to check into the group, tell us your deployment struggles, and remember that I do have a free deployment support group on Facebook. It's much bigger than this book club. It's called Handle Deployment Like a Boss. 
and that is the group where you can get all of the daily interactions. People are asking tons of questions about care packages and relationship troubles and what to expect at the beginning of deployment or in the end. And it's wonderful to share your countdown with other spouses who are going through the same journey. So I hope that you will join that more active group, the Handle Deployment Like a Boss group on Facebook. And I will see you next time in the Deployment Book Club. This is Lizanne Lightfoot, the Seasoned Spouse.